Humans are great storytellers. We can weave such a believable and intricate tale that even the most skeptical among us can be convinced of its truth, or at the very least, of the sound logic or reason of the story. And the best stories are those that make complex processes simple, because they provide us with an easy, intuitive way to view ourselves and the world in which we occupy. But as scientists and consumers of scientific knowledge, we cannot be so easily duped by a good yarn. Our desire to seek patterns and deterministic explanations for what we see around us should not cloud the fact that stochasticity or simple randomness is a reality. Our human psychology conspires against us, uh, understanding chance as a fundamental part of biology. Uh, despite us intellectually accepting laws that are derived using probability instead of strict determinism, such as Mendel's law of segregation. Nowhere is the great storytelling of humans more apparent than in our own origins. Even before modern evolutionary theory, humans told a myriad of tales about how we came to be on Earth, whether molded from clay in the Abrahamic myths or whittled from wood in the North Norse myths. In all of these stories, agency plays an important role. We look the way we do, act the way we do, because of an explicit purpose. That purpose was either ordained from above, or it was constructed by the guiding hand of natural selection. But what if I told you that that story, the classical tale of human adaptation, is largely just a story too, with little more support than the creation myths of old? That the majority of human evolution, both phenotypic, genetic, and cultural, is driven not by any guiding hand, but by devilish random chance. Let's start with a hypothetical. Shown here is a plot of time on the X and the mean trait value on the Y for a fictitious population. An incredibly strong positive correlation exists. In fact, it's highly statistically significant, at p being less than 2.2 e to the negative 16. This means that this correlation is exceptionally unlikely to be due to chance alone. Most would see this positive relationship as evidence that natural selection is favoring a trait to change in a given direction, driving adaptation. Indeed, many paleontologists have looked at these sorts of changes in mean phenotypes through the fossil record and taken this change as evidence of positive selection on that trait. Now let me show you how I generated those data points. Each point is a random draw from a normal distribution, where the point at time point 2 depends only on the value drawn from time point 1, and so on. We call this Brownian motion, a term borrowed from physics to describe the diffusion of gas particles. In short, the trajectory is completely random. This becomes obvious when the process is repeated a hundred times, as I've shown in the figure here. Some traits barely change, staying around zero, while others changed in opposing directions. In short, random chance can generate the appearance of directional phenotypic change. Thus, to infer the action of selection as opposed to random processes such as gene flow and genetic drift, we need to employ rigorous statistical methods that can distinguish these processes, i.e. we can't rely on storytelling alone. This leads me to this fascinating study recently published in the Journal of Human Evolution by paleoanthropologists Lauren Schroeder and Rebecca Ackerman, titled Moving Beyond the Adaptationist Paradigm for Human Evolution and Why It Matters. In this review, the authors note how the rhetoric around human evolution has changed throughout the decades, and that a shift to the study of phenotypic variation as opposed to merely tracing mean trait trajectories provides a richer and more nuanced view of the evolutionary processes underlying human evolution. This provides a series of case studies demonstrating the importance of focusing on the neglected processes of evolution, i.e. genetic drift, and gene flow. They begin by noting how much of our understanding of hominin diversity has changed over the past 50 years since the founding of the Journal of Human Evolution. 
Well, obviously, we've discovered dozens more hominin species. The most striking discovery has been how many of these hominin species were contemporaries. At any point in time, there were no less than three or four species living in Africa at the same time, assuming we've discovered every species that existed, a, a very unlikely assumption to be sure. Indeed, the hominin family tree is much more bush-like than was thought 50 years ago. Next, they discuss how a more holistic view of evolution can defend against adaptationist storytelling. While theoretical population genetics began in the early 1900s with the work of R.A. Fisher, J.B.S. Holday, and Sewell Wright, it wasn't until the work of G.G. Simpson in the 1950s that paleontological work began to incorporate the notion of genetic drift. Simpson drew heavily from Wright's shifting balance theory, arguing that ancient populations were often maintained at a fitness maximum and that to shift between different adaptive peaks required an environmental shift that might cause a population bottleneck. Genetic drift then dominates due to weakened selection and allows the population to cross a sort of adaptive valley to explore a new peak. However, Simpson's argument was largely verbal and did not incorporate a rigorous mathematical evaluation. Indeed, at the time, it was understood that phenotypic variance was controlled to some extent by underlying genetic variants, but little was known about the nature of this genetic variance. It wasn't until the work of Moto Kimura in the 1960s that we realized that most genetic variance uh, was neutral and that the change in frequency of any allele in a population was mostly dictated by genetic drift. With this theoretical background, the groundwork was laid for a more advanced model of trait evolution that incorporated the randomness of genetic drift. These models built on the work of R.A. Fisher, who first studied polygenetic inheritance, that is, a trait whose phenotypic variance is determined by more than one genetic variant. These models include the well-known heritability estimators, which seek to describe the expected response of a trait to selection given the contribution of both genes and the environment to the variance in that trait. When we only consider additive genetic variants, that is, ignoring dominance and epistasis, we can derive the famous breeder's equation, which is R equals H squared S, where R is the expected trait response H is the narrow sense heritability, and S is the selection coefficient. Narrow sense heritability, again, is simply the variance in a trait that can be prescribed to the additive genetic variance. Schroeder and Ackerman then introduced the groundbreaking 1976 paper by Russell Landy, who utilized a quantitative genetics model to understand trait evolution in fossil populations that incorporated both natural selection and genetic drift. In many ways, the Landy model generated a test of selection against a null hypothesis, with the null being that the change in some trait value was generated just by drift alone. Let's start with the simplest iteration of the Landy model and build up from there. At the base level, Landy considered a vector of trait responses, delta Z, before and after selection, as the product of a matrix, G, and a vector, beta. The G matrix includes the additive genetic variance for each trait along the diagonal with the off diagonal representing the genetic covariance between each of these traits. The vector beta is the selection coefficients acting on each one of these traits. That was a mouthful, but it has really cool implications. First, it shows that if the traits are highly covariable, a developmental biology phrase for this is highly integrated, then regardless of the direction of selection acting on each trait, they will all tend to follow the same trajectory. However, if traits are unlinked, i.e. they don't covary with one another, then they will simply follow the direction of selection acting on each of them independently. It's easy to see how trait correlations can actually lead to evolution going in the opposite direction of natural selection. For example, if selection is acting to increase brain size in humans, which is correlated with skull size, and an increase in skull size necessitates an increase in body size, then even if selection were acting to keep body sizes smaller, if selection for brain size is more intense, then the net direction may be bigger brains and bigger bodies, despite bigger bodies being selectively disadvantaged. Again, this is because these traits are highly correlated. Increases in skull size necessitates an increase in body size. 
If these traits were decoupled, then selection could mold each of them in opposing directions. With the simple Landy model described, now let's add the good stuff that incorporate a bit of randomness. As I showed in the simple Brownian motion simulation at the beginning, traits are expected to vary over time just by chance alone. In 1979, Landy showed that we can incorporate this as genetic drift acting on the matrix of covariances as the product of G and the ratio of time, T, and the effective population size. Thus, the smaller the population size relative to time, the greater the influence of drift has on the covariance matrix. Incorporating selection, assuming that T and the effective population size can be estimated, researchers can calculate what's known as the generalized genetic distance, which is shown here. Using a chi-square distribution, researchers can then test if the genetic distance between two fossil species differs significantly from expectations under random drift alone. James Cheverud in 1988 made significant advances to Landy's original model. As you've probably recognized, the shortcoming of Landy's model is that it's still fundamentally a quantitative genetics model, where fossils quite rarely have genetic variants that can be directly measured. What Cheverud found, and what became known as Cheverud's conjecture, is that genetic variants and phenotypic variants generally mirror one another. Thus, substituting phenotypic variants for genetic variants in Landy's model should still accurately capture the dynamics that Landy sought to describe. Armed with a model that accounts for neutral evolution, Schroeder and Ackerman then review the literature across a suite of traits measured in hominin fossils. Let's do a lightning round of the different papers they discuss and the traits that they were found to be evolving neutrally or under directional selection. So Weaver in 2007 found that a neutral pattern of evolution explained craniomorphological differences between modern humans and Neanderthals. Uh, Schroeder and Ackerman in 2017 found that for a range of traits in homo skull morph morphology, most had evolved neutrally, including the divergence between homo naledi and other homo species. Again, Schroeder in 2014 found evidence of selection driving skull divergence between Australopithecus sediba and Australopithecus africanus and other homo species, but that transitions from Australopithecus africanus to homo followed a completely neutral pattern of evolution. Grabowski in 2016 found strong evidence for selection on brain size evolution, but a neutral pattern for body size. However, another study found strong evidence for selection on both, both brain size and body size evolution in Homo floresiensis compared to all other Homo species. And finally, they cite several studies that find evidence for selection for brain size in the divergence between Australopithecus and Paranthropus, but not within each of these genera. Here's a table they present comparing a range of results from Landy's generalized genetic distance and the rate of evolution between several hominin comparisons. Again, natural selection is expected to increase the rate of change between two species, and so deviations from Landy's expected null can be captured statistically. However, for each of these comparisons between various Homo species and between Homo erectus and Australopithecus africanus, a null model of genetic drift cannot be rejected. Only in the divergence of Australopithecus africanus and Paranthropus boisei is there evidence for natural selection elevating the rates of evolution. They conclude their section on the importance of genetic drift with, quote, the framework of evolutionary quantitative genetics provides a series of simple yet powerful approaches that have advanced our understanding of the complex, multi-process morphological divergence in hominin evolution, highlighting the prevalence of genetic drift in human evolution. Next, they examine a second important process often overlooked in human evolution, gene flow. In the rest of the video, I will use gene flow and hybridization interchangeably as they represent effectively the same thing, that is, migration from a genetically distinct population or species that brings new variation into the population of focus. I will use the word introgression to mean establishment of a genetic variant from one population into another.
Here, we should also note that species is a fluid concept and that in general, biologists don't adhere to a strict definition that completely restricts gene flow. Two organisms can still be considered good species even if they occasionally interbreed. This is because genomes are generally porous. That is, alleles that don't impact functional regions can very easily intergress between two species. There exists a rich body of literature on the interaction between genetic drift, gene flow, and natural selection. First, we need to recognize how genetic drift and selection generate different patterns of introgression across the genome. At an equilibrium between gene flow and drift, the proportion of introgressed alleles into a parental population will equilibrate around the rate of migration. For example, if migrants are contributing 10% of the variation to the population every generation, then on average and at equilibrium, individuals in the parental population will have 10% hybrid ancestry. However, selection can act in opposing ways depending on the impact of those hybrid alleles. For example, if most of those hybrid alleles are strongly deleterious, then the actual equilibrium proportion of hybrid ancestry should be less in the parental population than expected due to just the migration rate alone. Alternatively, some of those alleles may be favored by selection, and thus may be at much higher frequency than expected based on drift alone. Schroeder and Ackerman focused on biased historical narratives around hybridization, which has generally led to it being underappreciated in the study of animals. They note that while G.L. Stebbins, a botanist and one of the early supporters of the modern synthesis, saw hybridization as a creative force in maintaining uh, and generating new variation in plant populations, many animal geneticists saw hybridization in a negative light. They focused mostly on how hybrids had reduced fitness, which generally led to seeing hybridization as an anomaly in evolution. However, in the past decade or two, hybridization has been evaluated in a much more positive light in animal studies. This has been driven in large part thanks to advances in genomics, which has demonstrated widespread introgression across diverse lineages. For example, a recent study on swordtail fish found extensive reticulate evolution with many lineages harboring alleles introgressed from divergent taxa. So, how prevalent was hybridization in the history of human evolution? Remember that at any point in time, there were likely multiple hominin species, which may have provided ample opportunity for hybridization. We now have strong evidence for hybridization between modern humans and Neanderthals, as well as Denisovans, and even have evidence of a first-generation child that had a Denisovan father and a Neanderthal mother. We have identified signatures of adaptive introgression from Neanderthals for skin pigmentation and hair phenotypes, as well as immune and altitude adaptation. In addition, there's consistent evidence for selection purging the more deleterious variants that were introgressed from both Neanderthals and Denisovans, indicating the gene flow coupled with natural selection can, in a way, take the good without the bad. Ultimately, we now have evidence across animals, including humans, that hybridization has played a major role in evolution, both in providing neutral variation as well as introducing novel adaptive alleles for selection to act upon. In concluding, Schroeder and Ackerman write, quote, We wish to emphasize that while there has historically been an adaptationist perspective to the study of morphological change through time in human evolution, it is now clear that the evolutionary forces of selection, gene exchange, genetic drift and mutation have all played a role in our diversification. As has been discussed elsewhere, strict adaptationist thinking does a disservice to understanding the complexity of evolution. They display this complexity in this figure, which summarizes what we presently know about the different forces of evolution. The circles represent current estimates of forces driving cranial, mandibular, and dental evolution across the hominins, with yellow circles being genetic drift, orange for gene flow, and purple for natural selection. By adopting a more holistic view of evolution, we can see that the forces of gene flow and drift are as important, if not more important, in the evolution of humans as natural selection. If we're going to understand evolution, and especially the evolution of humans, we must be willing to go beyond adaptive storytelling and utilize the plethora of statistical and theoretical methods at our disposal to tease apart each of these interacting processes. As the philosopher Karl Popper once wrote, a theory that explains everything explains nothing. Natural selection only works as a good explanation if it can adequately rule out other forces, 
Otherwise, it comes dangerously close to every other discarded creation myth invoked throughout human history. Thanks so much for being here. I hope you learned something. If you found this paper interesting, I've linked it in the description box below. Be sure to check it out. Thanks so much for being here, and I'll catch you next time.